Hello and welcome, Jess. How are you doing? I'm doing good, and you? I'm good, thank you. How was your week? Freezing. It's here in England, and it's I think it was negative five this morning. Um, oh wow! <laughs> so from coming from California, it's not something I'm used to. I'm born and raised in Bermuda, which is where I am right now, but. I normally live in London, so I'm, you know. I understand. <laughs> so before we get started, Jess, just for some people who might be listening and have no understanding, would you explain what being transgender is? Being transgender, um, I never, never, never identified as a, as a boy. I was born, I'm 56 now, and um, and as as young as is four years old, I wanted to live life as a girl. And there's a, a lot of variations of transgender. You have male to female, female to male, gender non-conforming, gender fluid. So there's a huge colundrum, as we like to say, like a colundrum of butterflies. No two of us are the same. So when you hear one transgender person's story, you've heard one transgender person's story. So me, gender, Transgender is technically is you don't feel comfortable the gender you're given at birth, that you're assigned at birth. You feel a disconnect. And another term for it is gender dysphoria. Okay. Very difficult thing to explain because how do you feel that you know as a young child? But according to the American, American Academy of Pediatrics, most children know by the time that they're four years old of how they identify. Not everybody but a good percentage of people know by the time they're four of how they feel comfortable. They understand how they identify. And again, okay. not everybody. Um, would you mind if we start talking about the difference between, um, for example, sexual orientation versus gender identity? Would mm -hmm. you tell people the difference? Because I think a lot of people think people who are transgender are, are gay as well. But gender and sexuality are two different topics. I personally don't think transgender, I don't think it should be in the LGBTQ plus community, or it could be in the Q, but it should not be. Okay, because it's a completely different topic. But our numbers are so small. We're 0.6% of the world's population. We're similar to the gay community, so we need to come together to help. But the thing is for America with the older community that the older lesbian and gay community don't accept transgender people. If you want to be with a guy, just be gay. You don't have to have a sex change to be with a guy when they don't understand this is who I am. This is who I identify as. That makes sense? Yes. And I think a lot of people are so confused about that. Yeah. So would you share your story of growing up and knowing since the age, I believe you said four, yeah. So my parents, I'm um, living here in England, um, but my parents are originally British. They came from Manchester. My sister was born here, actually. And they migrated to the United States in, I think, the late 50s. And they started raising a family. I had two older brothers and I was born in 1965. So when I was a young, young, young child, I didn't understand it. I wanted to look, act, dress, and live like a girl. I had a very best friend down the street. We played dolls. We played tea party. We played dress up. I was in my sister's closet. I was in her, my mom's closet. I wanted to look like a girl. I'd go to her house, my friend's house. We played dolls. We painted our fingernails. And at five years old, I wanted to be her. And that did not make sense. And it wasn't something you can go talk to your mom, your dad about. This is 1969, 1970. So I hit it. And I begged God night after night, day after day to turn me into a girl. So I did different, different things. And I did different activities. And I started collecting stamps and collecting bugs. And whatever I did, I would focus all of my time and attention to it. We call them coping mechanisms. And that's what I dealt with it and that's how I dealt with this wanting to be a girl at a very young age and the feelings didn't go away they just grew stronger and stronger and life went on begging God night after night and um, so now I'm not begging God to turn me in girl I'm saying God if you can't turn me in girl take these feelings of wanting to be a girl away from me it doesn't make sense but the feelings never went away and life went on when I was about seven years old and I learned the difference between boys and girls I got rid of that penis I'd be a girl. So at seven years old, I snuck a razor blade into bed and physically tried to remove my penis at seven years old. 
And as you'll find in the transgender community, that's not uncommon. A lot of us did the similar thing, but it didn't go too far and life went on. My parents introduced me to the game of soccer and here in Britain, we call it football. And I obsessed with that and I became better and better and better. And when I was on the soccer field for 90 minutes, I was not thinking about wanting to be a girl and it became the greatest coping mechanism in the world. I was offered scholarship. I was offered big positions at, for the United States Olympic Committee asked me to try out for the 1984 Olympic team. That's how good I was. But in 1982, I was always attracted to boys and I did not understand that. I wanted to be a girl and sexuality was kind of fluid. I didn't understand myself at that time. I wanted to be a girl. But, um, but when I was 17 years old, I had a lot of girlfriends as, because I enjoyed hanging around girls. And I met a young girl a young girl named Barbara. Barbara was 15 years old. She was beautiful, kind, quiet. We started a friendship, felt comfortable with her. I could go to the mall with her, go shopping with her and didn't understand it. We started a boyfriend, girlfriend relationship, didn't understand myself. And after being together for a number of months, I came out to her. And you can imagine you lost your virginity to your boyfriend. He says, I want to be a girl. She flipped out. She came back and she says, you know what? I love you and I accept you. In 1982, she was 15 years old. So we spent several years together, started planning our lives and a relationship, proposed to her on Christmas 1984, and my life was going wonderful. I got somebody that loves me and accepts me. So I picked her up for work a couple of weeks before Christmas in 1985, picked her up from work a little bit early. We went and had lunch together. We're driving home. It was a beautiful day in Southern California. And as we came through a green light in Southern California, a lady that was high on heroin and drunk at one o'clock in the afternoon ran a red light at 65 miles an hour. She broadsided us. We rolled a total of seven times and a moving truck hit us head on head. We rolled another five times and um, we were airlifted to Northridge Hospital. During that helicopter flight, I died several times. I, they broke my sternum, bringing me back to life in my chest. I broke my neck, my jaw was shattered. I was in a coma for several days. The next time I got to see Barbara, she's lying in her white coffin in her white dress. I'm 20 years old, never, never, never seen a dead body before, never been to a funeral. And now the closest person in the world to me is now being buried. You can imagine how dark my life came. I attempted suicide dozens of times. I drank, cocaine became my drug of choice. I did not know how to cope with this. And this went on for 1986, going into 1987 to fix myself. I probably slept with 30, 40, 50 different women. Half the time couldn't get an erection. I didn't understand myself. And then in June of 1987, I took a trip up to my parents' house. My parents had since retired and lived in Yosemite Lakes Park up in the Central Valley of California. Get up to my mom and dad's house and my mom takes me for a walk and we started a long conversation. During this long conversation, it came out that she knew that I wanted to be a girl. She knew ever since I was about three, four years old. It turns out that they planned on transitioning me when I was five years old. I had no idea. They had taken me to the very, very world famous psychologist named Dr. John Money at UCLA. Well, Dr. John Money's very, very popular because he was considered the best doctor in the world on transgender issues in the late 60s. But his theory was it's nature versus nurture. The way you raise a child is the way the child's going to become. So my parents took me to see him to start my transition when I was four years old. And he convinced them he's a boy, immerse him in sports and football and baseball. It'll cure him. So my parents took the advice of Dr. John Money and immersed me in sports, moved me away from Michelle and did all that kind of stuff. Dr. John Money's very famous for a case of two boys. And when these two boys were born a few months after I was, they had a problem during circumcision and one of the little boys lost his penis. They had no idea what to do. So Dr. John Money came in and says, let's use this child as a social experiment. It's nature versus nurture. And they raised little David Raymer as a girl. Well, he hated being a girl. It's a long, long story. And if you study psychology, you'll understand it. Well, he finally found out, detransitioned at 15, 16 years old. Later in life, his brother committed suicide and, and he put a shotgun in his mouth and committed suicide a few years later. It's a very, very famous case. So to the transgender community, Dr. John Money's considered the devil. So I came out to my parents in 87, but I didn't come out sexually because that was still one more huge hurdle. And I was still confused. I went through a few years. Do I transition? Yes, no. Computers started coming out. 
there are people like me, there are doctors. So I took a construction job down in Southern California, wanted to raise twenty, thirty thousand dollars for my transition. Doing that, I met a young lady. We started a friendship, we started hanging around, and I came out to her and she says, I'll help you transition. We started working together, taking pictures of me, teaching me how to dress, walking with me, working with me. But we slept together a few times and she got pregnant. So during long, long conversations, we put my transition aside. We got married March of 1991 and August 18th, 1991, along comes my son, Jeffrey. And I was the perfect father, but I wasn't the greatest husband. I rarely slept with her, but she insisted and she got pregnant a second time. So now we have two little boys and I'm a contractor and the relationship between me and their mothers becoming farther and farther and farther apart. Finally, we split up and we divorced and the judge ordered joint legal physical custody. I had my children every other day, but I had a good relationship with her. I doubled her child support so my two boys can go to private school. I had a fantastic relationship with her. She was open and accepting to me. I kept it away from my two little boys. I had them every other day. Then long, long story short, me and her ended up on Christmas Eve together, spending the night one night together in 1998. She got pregnant off that one incident. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and then Curtis came into our lives in in September of, of 1999. Sorry, got, what age gap is that between the two? And there the was about a five, I, th I think there was a five-year age gap. So Curtis came into the life. We got back together. We didn't remarry, but we got back together. We buy a small house in Reseda in California. We sold that house. We moved up the central coast to a place called Santa Maria, California. It's on the central coast of California, part of Santa Barbara County. You can imagine, it's really, really pretty. She's working, I'm working, we buy a house. The day we closed ESCO, she quit her job and says, I wanna go back to school full time. I said, that's fine. I got three boys, massive mortgage payment, two car payments. She said, we'll do it together. So she quit her job and now I'm working seven days a week in the relationship between me and her mother. Their mother's falling farther and farther apart. Finally, owning, after owning this home for about three months, I come home, she says, F you. She takes the three boys, moves to the Southern California. And, um, and I fought her and she says, you raise Jeffrey and Bradley, I will raise Curtis. And she moved a hundred miles south. She said, you raise the older two boys. And I said, no, let Curtis come live with us. She said, you live your life, I'll live my life. And she moved a hundred miles south. So in turn, I gave her $40,000 for her portion of the house. And I filed for custody for all three boys, which started a three-year legal battle that cost me $65,000. During this three-year legal battle, the judge, it was told during the requested an evaluation, the evaluator asked me, do you want to be a woman? I was very true. I said, yeah. Do you, are you attracted to men? I said, yeah. During this long custody battle, Rachel goes in there, says, I've always known he wanted to be a woman. I have pictures of him. The judge did not care. In August of 2007, gave me full legal, physical custody of all three boys. So now here I am, a single father raising three boys. Long story short, the doctor says that she has to be bedridden for about a month. She can come stay with us while she recuperates. She starts staying with us and she starts saying, let's get back together. And I said, no, I need to transition. So we made it a deal and I worked with her. She said, I will help you transition. This is my children's mother, my ex-wife. She says, I know you want to do it. I will work with you. So we rented a five bedroom house in a little town called Tulare in Central Valley of California. I was in the master bedroom. I paid the rent. I supported her. I put her through school. She went to medical school to become a dental hygienist. And we had our three boys in their separate bedrooms. We rented a five bedroom house and we started planning on how we're going to do my transition. She says, you have all my support in the world. All I ask is we wait till our youngest is 12 years old. He's too young now, right now, Jeff. You tell Jeffrey and Bradley. And she worked with me. She goes, you stay here in California. I'm going to move to Plano, Texas to stay near my sister. You can talk to Curtis anytime you want. All I ask is we wait until he's a little bit older to understand. You have to understand that, Jeff. So she convinced me. Can I ask I, you a question though here, no. Jess? So one thing that I've read is that the best time to to tell your children is either when they're children or when they're adults because at teenage years it's the hardest for them to handle is that true yes it is but I did not know this at the time yeah. okay and I had her 
100% supporting me saying, this is how we're going to do it, Jeff. We would go walks every single night. We're on the internet looking for how to pull up hormones. She graduated her medical school. My eldest son, Jeffrey, graduated his school. They moved to Plano, Texas. I came up there on Christmas during a long conversation. I came out to my eldest son. He was 18 years old. He was going to be the most difficult. And he came back and he says, you have my 100% support. You have my 100% support, dad. About two months later, I came out to my middle son on the phone. He says, you have my 100% support, dad. You've always been there. I've learned about it. I've read about it. So we started planning. I did my transition. I'm on the phone with my youngest boy three, four, five times a day. And I did my whole transition and everything went fantastic. My son and me, Jeffrey, are living together in a condominium in California. He's my number one biggest ally. My son Bradley comes back and forth to Texas to California. He goes, he, lo he looks at me, he goes, you look a little bit different, dad. Hugs me and it became a non-issue. I'm on the phone with my youngest three, four, five times a day. Well, now my youngest is 12 years old and I say, it's time we tell him. So I start calling their mother saying, Rachel, it's time we tell Curtis. Suddenly she cuts off all phone communication. Jeffrey or I can't get hold of Bradley or Curtis or their mother. I'm texting her, emailing her, sending her registered letters. I have no idea what's going on. I buy a plane ticket to fly to Texas. Before that plane ticket arrives, I receive a letter from the state of Texas. Rachel Butterworth, my child's mother has filed suit to remove my parental rights to my youngest child. My choice of a lifestyle is dangerous. I flip out. I start calling attorney after attorney. Every one of them saying three to $500,000. I said, I have full custody. We have an agreement. They're saying, this is Texas, Jessica. I find an attorney named John McCall. He says, yours is an open and shut case. Wire me $2,000. I know her attorney. I wired him $2,000. We went in front of the judge, said, here is your, here, I have full legal physical custody. The judge says, not anymore, you don't. Curtis has been in Texas for more than six months. Your custody is now null and void. During this long day of court, my attorney goes, Jessica and Rachel had an agreement. The judge would not allow it in the courtroom. During this long day of court, um, her attorney says, uh, Jessica has taken the most selfish acts a parent can take to change their gender from man to woman. Jessica is no longer Curtis's dad because I'm a woman. So during this long day of court, the judge goes to orders. They requested a psychiatric evaluation by a Dr. Ben Albritton who turned out to be a right-wing theology professor that's known in the state of Texas to vote against the LGBT population. It was a court order. If I do not do it, I go to jail. He says, second order, if I talk to my child, I'm allowed to speak to him anytime I want on the telephone. If I tell my child that I have transitioned, he will personally come to California and throw me in jail. What? The and judge said this. The judge says this. I have the documentation that I show during my presentations. I have the court transcript. You are going to jail. There will be no bail. He says that if I tell my own child that I've transitioned. Now, I want you to think about this. That same judge in that same Texas courtroom recently in 2018 reduced a lady's bail for murder from $1.5 million to $140,000 for fatally shooting her black husband. And he reduced it. So for $14,000, she walked free. But that judge is saying, me being a transgender woman, telling my own son that I had full physical custody of is more dangerous than having executed somebody. Think about that. So tell me, Jess, can you as a judge legally change the custody for the fact that one of the parents is transgender? Legally, no. Okay. More and more laws have come. My, my case has helped change laws. So the judge ordered to have evaluation. This right-wing evaluator came back and said I was the better parent. He said, if I don't have this evaluation, I go to jail. This right-wing evaluator came back and said, I am the better parent. I should start seeing my child immediately. The judge would not allow it in the courtroom because they said it was bias and the judge agreed. So in June of 2013, we went to court and during a long day in court, the judge goes, go home and I'm gonna email you my results. Came home that Monday, came home that Friday, turned on my computer, Judge Scott Becker has removed all of my parental rights. This judge said, I'm never allowed to see my child, never allowed to speak to him, never allowed to send him a birthday card ever, ever, 
ever again. And this my is case, only for your youngest. This is for my youngest, right? So my case went everywhere. I sent my paperwork everywhere across the country, Department of Justice, everything. Later that year on Christmas Eve, I have the envelope that I show. On Christmas Eve, I came home from work and there in the mailbox, yellow envelope from her attorney to me. I open it up, sitting in my white little car, Christmas Eve, 2013. What does it say? Please find an enclosed copy of the order of determination. They mailed me a copy of the judgment on Christmas Eve to say, Merry Christmas, Jessica. Fuck you. You will never see your little boy again. I sat there shaking, crying, go, why would they do that? But they didn't stop there. Went to page four of that same document. This judge said, he took my name of my child's birth certificate. My case went all the way to the top of the Department of Justice. They did a huge investigation. They said, there's not much you can do about it. This judge crossed every T, dotted every I. He would take you years and years and years in Superior Court. There's not much you can do about it, but use your story, talk about it. And I started speaking about it. There were more and more investigations. And um, like I said, this is the first and only time in US history that a parent with a supportive active role has been removed of a child's birth certificate. This judge went that far because and I am transgender. all discrimination. Discrimination. So, so that's what I did. And I started speaking about it. My youngest is now 21 years old. She changed his name, could not find him, could not find him. When he turned 18, I went straight from, I was doing a speaking tour of India, went straight to Texas, could not find him, hired a private investigator. She has changed his name. And we know kind of where he is in California. We've seen him on social media. I've reached out to him, but he's not responded. I'm so sorry that you've had to go through this. And the fact that you still haven't seen your youngest son. Do you remember the last time you saw him? How long ago that was? Yeah, it's 2013 because him and his mom and brother came to California and I went to Bob's Big Boy with him for a quick dinner. And he's just going, when do I get to see your dad? And that was the last time I saw him. You how know what old, I'm saying? How old was he then? He was 13. Oh, yeah. And, wow. um, and so now he's 21 years old. I haven't seen him in that many years. Right? And what's his name? Curtis. Curtis. If, yeah. if you could, if Curtis could hear you right now, what would you want him to know? I just want to know that I love him more than anything and that I'm super, super proud of who he is and that I want him to know that I love him and that I fought tooth and nail him. I didn't leave him stranded. I was there. Well, I hope that you get to be reunited with him someday. Yeah. Um, you say you, you refer to yourself still as a father. Do your children call you dad still or do they, do you ask them to call you something else? No, in private, in one telephone, my son Jeffrey calls me dad. And in public, he calls me Jessica or Aunt Jessica or bitch. No, just okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, but so final question for you. Um, what advice do you want people to know who are going through a transition or thinking about it? My biggest advice is, I say this all the time, three words, go for it. You have to live your life. You would be so surprised on how supportive people really are. When I came out to my little brother, he laughed and he laughed. He goes, no wonder you always dress like a girl for Halloween. Okay. <laughs> you have to live your life. You have to be able to go into that mirror, look at that mirror and feel comfortable who you are. Feel comfortable who you wake up with. You can't spend the rest of your life because you see your parents once every six months, once a year, once a month, living your life for them, for their ideals that that's my son, that's my daughter. You have to feel comfortable. And that's the biggest thing. Sometimes you have to wait a little while, get through school, get through college, get through university. But when you can, go for it. Does that make sense? It does. And Jess, thank you so much for coming on today. I really, really appreciate it. And thank you for having me. Hopefully we get to meet up in London. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Bye, Jess. Have a good one. Bye.